Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the first ever home edition of Brews and Views. It's not only a different format as far as uh, how we're communicating and meeting, but we're also going to do a slightly different format uh, with the Brews and Views. So we started Brews and Views uh, with the Center for Ethics in the Life Sciences and Humanities um, a few years ago to address some of the most pressing questions in biomedical research. And we typically do it in a, um, in a debate style where we have two points and uh, a point and counterpoint and people discuss those uh, the issues and we try to reach some sort of consensus. Ethics, of course, is all about where you draw the line, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable, and how that line changes in different uh, cultures and environments. This has been an ongoing uh, program with the Institute for Quantitative Health Science and Engineering and um, Laura Cabrera, Len Fleck, and Libby bogdan Lovis, and Heather Hazard and I have been pulling uh, speakers from all over campus to address some of these important issues. Tonight's discussion will be a little different. We're going to set it up as a panel discussion so that everybody will uh, get a chance to ask questions. Please use the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your questions. We'll try to address as many of those as we can. So I'm Chris Kontag, and I'm the director of IQ and the chair of BME. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering and also of microbiology and molecular genetics. I'm trained as a virologist. I studied a virus that's very similar to the coronavirus we're all dealing with that's uh, around us in all news stations and all of our emails every day. Um, I studied a similar virus as a graduate student, and then I studied uh, mother infant transmission of HIV as a postdoc using genetics to track viral variants and how they, how they were distributed across uh, well, within populations and across the globe. Um, in the early 90s, the World Health Organization asked us to teach courses in, um, in Thailand and Russia and Brazil on how we can use genotyping to, to track. Uh, viruses and, and track the pandemic across the across the planet. With HIV, we had the advantage of that pandemic going very slowly. It's taken years to to reach across the across the globe. And when we started in this field, there were uh, two different types subtypes now called clades of HIV, and that we predicted at the time that they would that these this um, evolutionary tree of viruses would would become very uh, diverse over time and the five, the two clades would turn into five, the five into 30, and that's what's happening as these viruses recombine and, and change. So I have an interest in this, in this disease for you know, personal, scientific, and, and medical uh, reasons and thought we would pull this group of experts from across the MSU campus to discuss these issues because I thought it was important that we all understand that the virus that we're dealing with and the considerations and how to prevent its spread. So <clears throat> again, I want to thank all of you for joining us at the first home edition of Brews and Views. And at this challenging time of communication, it'll be uh, really critical that we understand how information is transmitted uh, among people and through electronic means to make sure that we deal with this pandemic in the most thoughtful way possible. And we have a tremendous group of panelists uh, to discuss these issues. And, and I'd like to just briefly introduce them and then ask them to introduce themselves and give uh, a little bit more background in, into why they're interested in, in participating in this, in this Bruise and Views and, and what compels them to uh, be outspoken in how we deal with the coronavirus outbreak and, and how we're gonna uh, attempt to control it through uh, communication, socialization, medicine, and science. So our first um, uh, panelist is Rich Linsky. He's a professor of, in the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics and has been studying evolution for a number of years. Uh, Brett Etchebarn is a professor of emergency medicine and is a practicing physician, but also a researcher developing rapid diagnostic assays. Len Fleck is, a, is the professor and acting director for the Center of Ethics and Humanities and in the Life Sciences, and has been a very active participant in the Brews and Views program, always bringing 
unique insights to um, uh, pressing questions in biomedical research and, and medicine. Maria Knight Lampsky is um, the Pinsky, sorry, is director of the College of Communication of Com Arts and Sciences, and uh, works in the area of health and risk uh, communication. And she'll tell us a little bit about the experiences in getting people to wash their hands and do the right thing to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. So we're going to spend the next hour and a half to, to hour and 45 minutes discussing issues of coronavirus, um, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, that causes uh, COVID-19 disease. And I put that in the description for in the flyer today because I think it's important that we understand uh, which is the virus, which is the disease, and that this is a, a coronavirus related to other coronaviruses that um, we've been studying for years in animal models and also in humans. Um, when you get a cold, it can either be a rhinovirus, an adenovirus, or a coronavirus. So many of us have been exposed to coronaviruses, but this is a new one. And that's why we call it the novel coronavirus, because it's new to the human population, and that's why it's such a significant problem. And I think we'll hear quite a bit about the, the, the background of this virus and what we know about it uh, from the panelists. So if we could start with, uh, with Rich, uh, Professor Linsky uh, from uh, MMG, and he'll introduce himself and talk a little bit about uh, the, the uh, blogs he's been writing on COVID-19 and, and the problems we're addressing today. Thanks, Chris, and hi, everybody. I thought one thing I wanted to do right at the beginning is thank all the healthcare workers out there. Uh, they're on the front lines of a confusing and difficult situation, the doctors, the nurses, the EMTs, and other people who are working when uh, some of us can work at home. So a, a big shout out of thank you to a lot of people. Um, the, the next thing I wanted to do was just read a quote from a former secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, a guy named Michael Leavitt, who was involved in planning for pandemics, and specifically he was thinking about an influenza pandemic. Uh, that's not quite what we face, but, but it's, it's words that really rung a bell for me. He said, everything we do before a pandemic will seem alarmist. Everything we do after a pandemic will seem inadequate. That's the dilemma we face, but it should not stop us from doing what we can to prepare. We need to reach out to everyone with words that inform, but not inflame. And so I think we're, you know, we're, we're balanced, we're poised right now between that preparation and feeling like things are inadequate right now. Um, so I got interested, um, uh, as Chris said, I'm an evolutionary biologist. I study the dynamics of microbial populations. I guess in the back of my mind, I've always wondered kind of why haven't we had a really huge pandemic. We had the HIV one that certainly affected many people, uh, and but maybe was confined largely to certain groups. Um, and yet with the spread of global travel and so on, it kind of, I always sort of thought as an ecologist and evolutionary biologist, wow, maybe we're not gonna get hit. And then suddenly I started reading about this situation in Wuhan. And I really got alarmed. And I remember the first blog post I wrote about it was, I went to sleep or I couldn't sleep one night when I said, wait a second, and this was in late January, five people have been diagnosed entering the US. How many people from Wuhan enter the US in a one week period? And I did a back of the envelope calculation, which suggested there were probably 10 or 50 times more people, maybe 100 times more people with the disease in Wuhan than was known at that time. And I've been tracking it ever since, uh, trying to sort of um, call attention to the trends uh, that have been coming. And I thought what I would say is now is just briefly sort of a couple of things about the challenges that I think we face. This is, I would say, a very tricky beast, this particular virus. It's tricky for th three big reasons, at least, one of which Chris already mentioned. It's new, so we don't have immunity uh, segregating or circulating within the human population. Possibly some of these other coronaviruses have given some of us a tiny bit of cross immunity. That's an open question, we don't know. But we don't have vaccines and we don't seem to have much immunity. The second thing that makes it a challenge and very frightening one is the high mortality. Um, it, it's not like it kills everybody. The estimates bounce all around. We can talk more about that, I'm sure. It depends on age, depends on the healthcare system and so on. But even for people who survive, there's maybe 
15, 20% that end up as quite severe cases that occupy IC units, ICU intensive care units for potentially weeks. Um, and so it's a, it's a burden and a potential crisis for the healthcare system if it continues to spread. And the third thing that makes it a challenge is despite that high mortality and the high level of severe cases, there seem to be a lot of mild or even largely asymptomatic cases. And that means there's a lot of hidden transmission networks that are being established that make it especially hard to trace. And then with the lack of testing kits or the testing procedures that we haven't, uh, we got off to a very slow start here in the United States, that's a challenge. The lack of personal protective equipment for healthcare workers adds another layer of challenge. And then I, the last thing I would say maybe in my introductory remarks is many of us, you know, followed the wildfires in Australia, the wildfires in California. And I would say we have something similar going on with these hidden entries of infections into this country spreading throughout many communities, largely undetected. It's a bit like embers of fires that are just smoldering somewhere and we don't know where they're going to pop up. China had a devastating situation in Wuhan, but it started from a single point source. It did spread within China, but with their extreme social distancing, which we really ought to call physical distancing because it's the physical separation, we're having a nice social event here. But in China, it started in one place and the trick was to contain it. Europe, by contrast, has had many independent introductions. So from some of the genetic evidence, it looks like at least five separate introductions into the, into the United Kingdom. Um, and so it's harder to track all those down. And I would say here in the US, it's that much more difficult because we've had probably a number of independent introductions from China, a number of introductions from the Middle East, a number of introductions of the virus into the United States uh, from Europe. And so we have this very distributed uh, uh, growth of these potential uh, wildfires starting from probably you know, dozens or hundreds of locations. And then as we move around the United States, asymptomatic people, people coming back from spring break and so on, uh, that spreads it into yet more communities. So that in a nutshell is my, my interest in it, my concern, my, my worries, and why I think we have to take this extraordinarily seriously. Great, thanks Rich. A large part of the solution to this problem is, uh, is communication and uh, education and getting people to do the right thing. And so I'd like uh, Maria to introduce her, introduce herself and talk a little bit about her research interest and how that uh, interest relates to COVID-19. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And you probably saw my son just stick his head into the frame in the back there. He's been wanting to do that in so many ways. Hopefully it won't happen again. Uh, yes, my name is Maria Lipinski. I am a faculty member in the Department of Communication. I'm also appointed in Michigan Ag Bio Research, and I direct something called the Health and Risk Communication Center which is a college-wide center in the College of Communication Arts and Sciences. And the people who are part of that center study communication processes. We don't study, some people work particular, Quinn, sorry. In particular uh, disease states or areas, um, but for the most part, they study social processes. Uh, my own research looks at how communication interventions shape people's behavioral decisions and how people share information about health issues with each other, how social norms are formed, and how social norms shape the decisions that we make. Um, I made a couple of notes about what I thought might be important for our discussion today, and I promise they'll be short. But I want to highlight a couple of big things. One is, as we understand health behaviors, we always try to think about them in a particular social context. And so um, I think I want to, you know, there's a lot of kind of discussion about communication for behavior change and how communication can shape people's behavior. But as communication researchers, we try and understand what is the social context, what is the um, policy context, what is the ecological context that um, shapes the way people make their decisions. So if you take a behavior like hand washing, for example, we've done a lot of research on that as a, a particular um, way to a self-protective behavior. And what we find is 
policies around people can shape decisions to hand wash, uh, placement of sinks, environment, availability of resources, um, all those factors go into making a decision about whether or not to wash one's hand, along with all the things that go on in our heads, right? So a lot of what I study is what goes on in people's heads as they make decisions about whether or not to engage in a risk behavior. The second thing I want to mention is one thing we know is that one of the best predictors of people's behavior, pe people's future behaviors is their past behavior. So, um, so oftentimes people, if you can give people opportunities to um, start behaviors or to create habits of some kind, this is a very powerful mechanism for shaping future behaviors. Our research has focused a lot on the internal predispositions that people have or internal um, characteristics that people have that shape their decisions. Okay, so we focus on things like how do people's perceptions of risk um, uh, drive their decisions to act? How do people's attitudes towards a behavior to drive their decision? How do their emotions or feelings drive their decisions? So in a case where we've got COVID-19, you have people with a lot of anxiety, and we know a lot about how anxiety shapes people's behaviors. One thing we know is it makes it hard for people to respond to information about a risk when they're highly anxious about something. Um, so, um, uh, and then the last thing I'll mention here is um, we study the ways in which people around us shape our decisions. We know that social norms are very powerful in shaping the things that we do. And by that, I mean what we see other people doing around us and what we believe other people around us think we should be doing um, around behaviors. So a lot of what we've done is to study how do social norms change? How are um, social norms shared with people? And how does communication play a role in that process? Um, I think I'll stop there. Uh, we, I have some other notes, and Chris, if, if we want to talk about those later, about how intervention can shape behavior change, um, I, can, I can talk about those later and in response to questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Maria. Um, so I'd like uh, Professor Fleck to go next and talk about the ethical considerations of, of healthcare distribution, because um, as we address this problem, one of the things we're going to have to face is that we'll be uh, challenged to distribute healthcare in, in a way that uh, will force uh, doctors and nurses to make very tough decisions at difficult times. So, Len, if you do an introduction and give us a little background. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Len Fleck, and uh, I'm a professor of philosophy and medical ethics, and I do some health policy kinds of things as well. Uh, I will mention in terms of my background that about 10 years ago, we were at this very same point where an, at that time, the governor of Michigan asked me to be part of a task force that was looking, that would look at what some of the ethics recommendations would be for addressing what was feared could become a pandemic at the time, uh, especially with regard to access to ICU beds, respirators, ventilators, uh, antivirals, and other kinds of scarce life prolonging resources. So that's the perspective that I think needs some attention today. You've probably seen in the past oh, week or two weeks a number of articles in the newspapers calling attention to concerns that physicians are going to have to make these awful rationing decisions, that they will have to decide who will live and who will die, that is, who will gain access to an ICU bed or who would be denied an ICU bed or who will be kicked out of an ICU bed. So let me just give you a kind of picture of why we are likely to be faced with physicians that are likely, and as a society are likely to be faced with those kind of choices. In the United States today, we've got 800,000 hospital beds. That's a lot of beds. Uh, we also have about 86,000 adult intensive care beds. And so that seems like an awful lot in the way of resources for addressing the kinds of needs that might arise in connection with COVID-19. However, one of the things you need to keep in mind that at any point in time, roughly 95% of those ICU beds are occupied. They're occupied by people who are very, very ill with stuff other than COVID-19. They have advanced heart disease, cancer, lung disease, and so on. And so it doesn't take very many COVID patients. If we had here in Lansing as few as 10 COVID patients who needed an ICU bed this evening, we would be faced with the kinds of choices, the kinds of tragic choices that we're talking about. So in that task force that I was part of back in around 2010, 
one of the things we had to decide is what should be the criteria that would be used to determine who would be given access to an ICU bed, who would be denied, and who would be taken out of an ICU bed. And the basic criteria have to do with the ability of individuals to benefit sufficiently from access to ICU care uh, and or who were likely unable to benefit sufficiently from access to ICU care or a respirator, ventilator, antivirals, and so on. So again, just to give you a kind of quick example here, uh, if individuals uh, who are already in an ICU bed have an end-stage cancer, a late-stage heart disease, and physicians believe that it's very unlikely, not certain, but very unlikely that that individual is going to survive that hospital stay, that individual is one of the kinds of individuals who would be removed from an ICU. In order to make room for a relatively younger individual with COVID-19, who has a much better chance of recovering as a result of receiving care within that ICU. Uh, likewise, there are people in an ICU who are in what you might think of the last day or two of their likely stay, and it's pretty sure that they are going to recover. You'd be more confident of that if they could stay in the ICU, but they also would be the type of individual who would be removed. In a worst case scenario, I mean absolutely worst case scenario, we would have to make decisions that would be based on age in addition to the likelihood of benefit. So in that uh, task force that I was part of 10 years ago, we said that if somebody was over age 70 and you had three or four people competing for one ICU bed, that is you had three or four more patients and there were ICU beds for each and every ICU bed, then older individuals who had already achieved a relatively long lifetime those would be individuals who would be removed from that bed, even if it were the case that they had a reasonable chance of surviving that hospitalization. These are the kinds of very, very controversial issues that will have to be addressed. My, one of my messages to the public at large would be that if it were the case that we end up in this kind of a situation over the next few weeks or the next few months, please be respectful of the health professionals uh, who have to make these very tough decisions. These decisions will not be made by any individual physician. The policy in most hospitals is that there will be a small cadre of health professionals who would re review carefully the circumstances of all the patients who are within an ICU. That would include a, an ICU physician, a nurse, and probably a bioethicist. And so that, that's, in general, how these decisions are going to be made. But the public ought to know that it's likely that these kind of very hard decisions will have to be made if COVID-19 continues to grow as much as it seems to have grown over the past couple of weeks just within the United States. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Len. Um, now I'd like uh, Brett Etchebarn to introduce himself. He's one of these individuals that's in the trenches. He's, he's a practicing clinician working in the ER at both McLaren and Sparrow. And, and um, I met Brett when he was doing diagnostic uh, test development for uh, bacterial infectious diseases and, and uh, been at the forefront of uh, drug resistance and infection for some time. Brett. Hello. Thanks, everybody. For, thanks for the invitation. It's very nice. Uh, it's interesting to get to hear from everyone and their perspectives on things. Um, luckily, this week I didn't have too many ER shifts. I was uh, at Sparrow earlier in the week, uh, so I did kind of get to see the triage system that's being in, instilled there. So they have an outdoor tent area where patients who are basically ambulatory and suspected of infection can be screened by an ER physician. Uh, the appropriate gear is being worn so they can get the nasopharyngeal swabs. Uh, then patients are sent to, there's only a couple of rooms really, even in the hospital, where uh, negative pressure is available. So it's always a quandary what to do when certain patients appear in the ER and you never quite know exactly what their infection might be or what's going on. And, Truly, many times it could be almost anything. So we 
we now are quarantining the patients. I heard initially it sounded a little scary. I'm glad I wasn't working, but they were putting patients who might be suspected in the room together, three at once in one hospital room, which to me is just a, just a nightmare scenario um, with no way to screen anybody rapidly and such a variation in the presentation from this illness being from, as was mentioned, completely asymptomatic all the way to fulminant respiratory failure, which, you know, truly can happen at all ages. There isn't there. Of course, the older you are, the more likely your system is going to be not performing optimally. That's the same for everyone in the world. And certainly the more medical comorbidities that you have, <clears throat> especially predisposed lung pathology, uh, all of this will be a setup for bad scenarios. Um, as of a few days ago, I knew of two patients in the ICU at Sparrow Hospital. Uh, I don't know the status of McLaren at this time. Um, but it with this sort of illness, you know, from a medical treatment perspective, it's simply supportive care. Uh, Dr. Cohen Tog had asked me what you need for basically a standing medical facility, and it's mostly will be respiratory care, but unfortunately, it's also the people who are going to be crashing are those that might have been destined for the ICU given their next insult anyway. So, this illness really is to me another thing that's added to the pile. Uh, you see humans with very poor presentations that have an undifferentiated viral illness. Um, most of us have suffered viral illnesses that are not quite unpleasant. And, and then influenza, I mean, in probably occupying a great deal of the ICU beds already, still in the United States would be, would be influenza patients who definitely perish due to uh, not only just the influenza illnesses itself, but the other conditions. And doing my research with uh, pathogens and uh, mostly bacterial and fungal pathogens, these are what kill you if they're untreated, certainly. Um, and the danger to me is that these, these will remain in, in the system. Uh, hopefully, as a byproduct of better hand hygiene and human hygiene in general, which I've always said, soap and water is your best antibiotic yet, undisputed champion. People don't like to don't like to hear that for some reason, and I don't know when hand sanitizer like climbed the climbed the staircase of medical treatment, but people seem to be obsessed with that stuff too and it doesn't kill tons of things. So I really don't recommend doing that anyway. But Dr. Contag knows how I feel about that. <laughs> um, so for me, the primary issues at hand as a healthcare provider are all the, the things that were mentioned by Dr. Lenski, and then of course, again, by Dr. Lipinski. Um, the pathogens are gonna remain out there and I saw some of the questions on the board, you know, will this go away? I hope so. Michigan, you know, spring lasts a little bit, kind of like California winter, I guess. But um, it will continue to spread, I think. And then it's going to flip to the other side of the globe. And probably when South America has their winter, it's not going to be very pleasant. Um, my research is in point of care diagnostics because I think if we have the ability to get somebody with lab values taken and uh, doctors with those results before a patient gets sick of being there and walks out the door or else has to go into a different part of the hospital where they're not properly quarantined or isolated and are still undifferentiated, all of this propagates further infection uh, no matter how you think about it. If we know that somebody has TB and HIV, we're all much like less likely to get infected by them than if we don't know what's going on with them, we're hanging out in the room together. So the same to, is to me any viral illness and this one in particular, which has pathogenicity within a very small radius. So 
if there's anything else, answer that later. Thanks, Brett. There was a question that came up from someone in the audience <clears throat> asked about an ICU bed. It was for both uh, Len and for Brett. The question is, when is it safe? Uh, when, when it is safe, uh, could you move an ICU patient to another facility if it was available? And uh, um, and for Len, what was considered? Uh, what, how did you consider this when you did the panel ten years ago? So has anything changed, or is it still the same? So let's start with Brett. If you would please just answer the question: uh, When can you move somebody out of the ICU and move them to another bed? And then Len. Um, talk about how this compares now with, with COVID-19 versus what you were dealing with 10 years ago. So, Brett? So, to me, medical care and critical care comes down to people with proper training and abilities, right? So, and uh, proper distribution of the workforce. So, one doctor can run most of the whole ICU with, with help. Uh, nursing care might be limited to maybe one, two, or three patients who are critical that they can care for at a time. Um, the ICU will generally, to me, be all of your patients with unstable vital signs and requiring high level of care, um, excuse me, such as a ventilator for airway monitoring, telemetry, where they need to be on the cardiac, respiratory monitoring at all times. Um, and possibly uh, infusion of drips, uh, such as vasopressors, um, things that need to be titrated. So only certain nursing staff will have the ability and training to operate all of the critical care sort of equipment. And then presumably there are limitations in the number of ventilator units that might be available to our our patients who come in and are in fulminant respiratory failure requiring intubation, which as Dr. Fleck mentioned, is a great deal of the population in the ICU setting already. And it's, it might become a situation where it's uh, like going to Haiti and there are four ventilators and many, many sick children in the whole city. So who gets which resources potentially could could become uh, an issue if there are limitations of either A, equipment, or B, people who are uh, able to handle, handle the work, more or less. Len, has anything changed in 10 years since you first thought about this issue? Uh, no, not that much has really changed. Basically, what would happen is patients who would be moved out of the ICU would be moved to ordinary hospital beds. They would be provided with palliative care or hospice care. But obviously, uh, if we don't, don't have any additional ventilators and they need ventilation, then um, the, you'd be faced with a very hard choice of perhaps sedating those patients to unconsciousness rather than uh, having them struggle to breathe, and they, they would die very quickly under those circumstances. Uh, as I say, those are tragic choices, and we hope they won't have to be made, but some of them are likely to have to be made at least in parts of the US. Thanks. So um, Rich, I have my opinion on the answer to this question, but I'm gonna let you address it. Question is, what does weather have to do with COVID-19 spread? What's, what's the issue that everybody's talking about? Warm weather, it's gonna get better, April's gonna be great. Um, can you address the weather issues? I, I, I certainly don't pretend to be an expert on it, but I mean, we certainly all have experienced that the flus tend to be worse in the winter and as we get into spring, but then we have fewer of them uh, during the, uh, the summer, for example. And so there is this hope that uh, this uh, virus will uh, go away of its own accord during the summer. Uh, I forget whether it was Brett or who mentioned that one of the issues is that uh, th this virus will go to the parts of the world where it's winter. Uh, so almost certainly it will circulate uh, as it is in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. In fact, it's already there. The, another fact that I have read, again, I'm not an expert, is that as Chris mentioned at the very outset, there are other coronaviruses that cause in most people relatively, you know, it feels like a cold or a, a, a mild flu or something like that. Uh, and so some of the papers I've read have suggested that those um, uh, the, those actually do circulate. They don't go, they may circulate a bit less in the summer, but they don't just go away. Um, and so one of the studies I saw said it's about a 
I, I forget the exact numbers, but there's a good chance that this winter we will see our biggest, right now what we're in will be the biggest uh, epidemic that we have, uh, but it could well be that next year uh, could be even worse. Uh, and so that creates a huge problem for thinking about social distancing or physical distancing. When can we begin to let down our guard? How do we do that in a way that protects people as much as possible? Uh, and uh, I think we don't really quite know the answers. Uh, it's uh, going to be a very important uh, uh, set of, of changes that we implement. By delaying things, however, by the social and physical distancing, by delaying things, we have more time for trials of therapeutics that might help individuals. We have more time for vaccine development. I think there's a lot of, and maybe Brett or somebody else will, will come in on this, but the you do read these headlines that, hey, we've got a vaccine already maybe in a trial or something, and that is great. There's an urgency. But even if we had a vaccine tomorrow that we knew was safe and effective, to scale it up to the level of the population as a whole is a huge challenge. They have to choose which virus uh, uh, for the influenza virus, which types to include about eight months in advance. And then there's a huge, massive production process to get vaccine made. So anything we can do uh, by the physical distancing to delay uh, uh, the epidemic uh, will be hugely beneficial in terms of therapeutics and the potential for vaccine. But how that plays out over the summer, I think is uh, pretty unclear at this moment. Jeff McKeegan weighed in on this too, one of our audience members. He said, remember that the weather in uh, Wuhan was 65 degrees and the weather in Milan was 65 degrees. And I would add to that that MERS grew out of uh, Saudi, out of the Middle East and a related virus also comes out of hot areas. And I would point out that one of the um, highest uh, uh, areas with the highest community spread right now is in San Francisco and they're around 65 degrees right now at this time as well. So um, I think just putting people in, in crowded places leads to, to uh, transmission and that's the, the correlation with weather. I don't know if it has much to do with, with uh, outdoor temperatures other than where people gather. So, um, so there was a question about how can people uh, either with lab experience or without lab experience contribute to the solution of this problem other than of course social distancing themselves um, are there things we can do like donating supplies, um, uh, volunteer lab skills, things like that? So Maria, could you uh, address the, the question of what's possible and how, how can you get, maybe just getting people to, to cooperate and listen to, to the guidance uh, of social distancing, but are there other things that can be done beyond that? I mean, sure. So you know, like anything, <clears throat> probably because I'm a social scientist, it all goes back to human behavior and human behavioral decisions. Um, I can't speak specifically to the question about whether or not people can donate lab time or any of those issues. What I do know is that, you know, there's a tremendous um, understanding at CDC and at other places around how to communicate in an epidemic like this, but yet there's still a lot of disconnect between somebody like me who studies this from a theoretical standpoint and then also goes to put this into practice um, and somebody who is, say, at the CDC or MDCH or um, some other place where they're doing health campaigns. Um, we know uh, from our work that communication campaigns are one strategy for, <laughs> for um, promoting particular health behaviors. So you can promote behaviors like hand washing or social distancing um, or other behaviors that are gonna slow the spread of this through communication campaigns. Um, but there's lots of different ways that interventions can be created to, <laughs> to um, promote risk reduction behaviors. <laughs> First it was my kids, now it's my dog. <laughs> uh, let me pause there. The challenges of work from home. Um, so <clears throat> that relates to another question that one of the audience members had, and that is, why is this virus more contagious than other virus, coronavirus, influenza, or any other virus? What makes this one so um, transmissible? And I think even 
if you compared it to flu and other things and the fact that we've, ne we've never seen a virus like this before so we don't have immunity, the transmission rates are still surprisingly high. When I look at those maps at the genetic diversity and how it tracks across the globe, it's, it's like wildfire. And why, uh, Rich, maybe you can address this. Why do you think this virus is so much more contagious than other viruses? I guess I really can't address it other than that that seems to be a biological fact. Um, and I'm sure there will be people who will delve into the, you know, the biochemistry and the molecular biology and the infection dynamics of this. But given that it's a fact, I think it's a useful, it's an incredibly important fact to know. So the estimate, there's this quantity of people in the audience, probably many of you have seen this uh, notation of R with a zero after it. It's often called R naught. And that's a description of the number of secondary infections for every person who has a, an infection. How many people do you give an infectious disease to if you have it yourself? It's a statistical average. Um, and for this particular coronavirus, the number seems to be about two and a half uh, for, for regular flu. For influenza, it seems to be a number more like 1.5. And these are very important numbers because for regular flu, a number of 1.5 means that there's an extra half infected person for everyone who has it, which means if you can cut the transmissions by a third, take it down from 1.5, down to one, that would halt the spread. But if you have 2.5 thereabouts as the rate of spread of this particular virus for whatever reason, you'd have to cut the transmissions by about 60% to take 2.5 down to a value of one or less. Now in Wuhan with their extreme social distancing, physical isolation, quarantining, the estimates from a recent paper where they took it all the way down from 2.5 to something like 0.3. And that's why they were able to stop the number of new cases. These were extremely draconian measures. People essentially under lockdown, under threats of arrest if they went out. And uh, you know, we live in a different country. Uh, we have different attitudes. We have a lot of skepticism towards advice and to science. And sometimes perhaps that's a healthy skepticism. But here, uh, it is a huge challenge. Uh, and we've begun, I think, picking off some of the low-hanging fruit. So some colleagues and I worked out some of the mathematics behind, well, how likely is it if we had had the March Madness tournament uh, that there would be an infected person in the finals? And uh, 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 that kind of thinking got people realizing we needed to cancel these very large group gatherings. But of course, for every large group gathering, there are that many more small group gatherings that are just as important. And again, what Wuhan and what China was able to do was to block so many of these secondary transitions that at least for now, they were able to bring it under control. Meanwhile, here with all these embers, these, these smoldering wildfires around the country, we're beginning to see them take off. Um, and there's this time lag between the infection and when somebody ends up in an ICU that makes it very difficult to know what's happening. But we're seeing this rapid rise and this is why I think it's very critical that we make every effort, uh, both as individuals and as uh, responsible officials for planning meetings and so on, to really reduce contacts, uh, to break the transmission cycles by bringing that abstract number from 2.5 down to below one. So we're fortunate enough to have Keith English also as the, in attendance. Keith is the uh, chair of pediatrics at MSU and um, pointing out some interesting uh, facts and observations about other viruses. I was hoping he would weigh in a bit on, on the RNOD. Uh, can, can you hear me? We can, thanks Keith. So yeah, so this is really interesting. So two comments, one about the weather. We don't understand today why it is that influenza really is a virus that peaks in the winter months in both the Southern and Northern hemispheres. We don't know why respiratory syncytial virus is a disease of the winter months in most parts of the world, but can occur year round in the tropics. We don't really know. We do know, we are worried about this R-naught, the transmission factor for 
this coronavirus because it does seem to be higher than seasonal flu. On the other hand, it's much lower than uh, viral diseases that are spread by airborne transmission. Uh, the big winner is measles with an R naught somewhere between 12 and 18. And the R naught for chicken pox is over 10. So they're much more transmissible, but uh, you know, usually not fatal. Uh, so this, this virus seems to have a combination of being more transmissible and at least in the elderly population with a high mortality rate, and that's a bad combination. But we don't know why. We don't understand why this virus is, you know, we don't understand why, you know, SARS and MERS, two really bad viral uh, pathogens that cause a lot of disease and, you know, sort of focal outbreaks, never became pandemics. We don't know why. And we don't know why this one is spreading so well uh, between people, but we're worried, obviously. So there's so much we don't understand about why this virus has been capable of uh, spreading the way it is, or even why it's this virulent. We don't really know. So Keith, as long as we have you on the line, I'll get to you in a second, Rich, hang on. But there's a question from the audience asking, is there herd immunity? And also when a person gets infected, will that person be immune to it after recovery? Um, do you have data related to that, uh, Keith? Okay. That's like the most important question that we don't really know the answer to. So there are reports of one or two people who may have been repeatedly infected with this virus. We presume there will be some immunity for people who get infected and survive. But number one, we don't know that for sure. And number two, we don't have any good way to test for that. We, we really need a test that will tell you that yes, this person, has been infected with this virus and uh, has recovered and is now immune, particularly for healthcare workers. We would love to know which doctors and nurses have been infected, got better, and are now immune because those are the people we would love to have on the front line. We, we don't know for sure about that. I will comment on kids. You know, children, fortunately, generally have less severe disease than adults for this disease. That's true even for the flu, but the flu does tend to cause, uh, you know, relatively bad disease in young infants and toddlers, even though it's worse in elderly adults. This virus really seems to cause pretty mild disease in most kids, although there are a couple of fatalities now reported in China. And nobody knows why that is either. There are two theories. One theory is that some of the other coronaviruses that, as you mentioned, Chris, circulate every year and can cause the common cold are more common in young infants than in adults and maybe we have some cross protective immunity from that big maybe we don't really know the other theory is that the receptor that uh, this coronavirus uses to enter cells which is the ace2 receptor uh, may be expressed at a lower level in young infants i'm skeptical about that uh, uh, explanation. We don't really know why, but there is some sort of clue here that young children usually get a cold from this virus and don't get a life-threatening illness, unlike uh, elderly adults. And if we understood that better, that'd probably be a good clue to how to combat this virus. Rich, did you want to follow up? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of comment on an aspect of, of uh, Keith's uh, excellent summary there. The, he mentioned that we don't quite know why um, MERS and the original SARS uh, uh, died out. And I, I could be wrong on this, but I think a lot of why it died out uh, was because of superb contact tracing. Uh, they never quite got to the point, I mentioned these sort of smoldering embers around the world now of all these separate introductions into countries large and small. And, and MERS and SARS seem to have been nipped just before that. And I think we see that uh, with the extreme social distancing as one solution, which is what Wuhan did. But in Singapore, they had a number of early introductions and they have done a phenomenal job of tracing each and every contact, putting them into isolation or for you know a couple of weeks. And they've really um, uh, uh, contained their outbreak in ways that a uh, few, if any, other countries have. But I fear that we are beyond the level 
of contact tracing. And unfortunately, that traces back in large part due to the failure of not having testing uh, that uh, was at scale needed until this thing has grown much beyond uh, what will allow efficient uh, contact tracing and containment by breaking known uh, transmission chains. There are just so many transmission chains that are hidden now. I've noticed I agree that, completely. I've noticed a lot of people are doing their own contact tracing if they've got a positive test or infected, they contact everybody that they've come in contact with and tried to do it themselves because we can't we can't do it as a society. It's just it's gotten way out of hand already. Uh, the question came up, Len, um, about should we have taken these same precautions with the H1N1 outbreak in 2009? Um, do you think that we, we learned anything from that? And, and uh, did we apply those rules well, or did we miss the boat uh, previously and not learn anything for this particular outbreak? What matters a lot, and this was one of the things we discussed uh, when we're, uh, as part of that H1N1 uh, panel, um, are the empirical details, the characteristics of the disease and so on. And H1N1 did not seem to have or represent the kind of threat that COVID-19 represents today. Uh, that is nearly as I can tell, that's my recollection from what we were talking about back then. So we never really considered the idea of having to do this kind of social separation, social distancing and lockdowns and uh, California, New York, and now apparently Illinois. Uh, that that consideration just never entered our conversation. Thanks, Len. Uh, Brett, you talked a few moments ago about uh, predisposing conditions to add serious uh, infection with, with COVID-19. And um, I was wondering if you could address some of the respiratory illnesses that are particularly bad, and some of those that are maybe more common. So. Um, for example, one of the uh, um, members of the audience is asking, what should people with asthma be thinking about and how should they be taking precautions? And do you see that as, that as a high risk population? Uh, I, I have heard, the scariest thing I've heard is if you have the lung disease and you come to the emergency department and you need to get breathing treatments, that the breathing treatments aerosolize the infection and cause more spread. Um, so I think a handheld inhaler is probably a better idea than using your nebulizer unit around your home and your family. Um, otherwise, I don't know of any other precautions. I would use your general standard precautions, you know, keep your stuff clean, keep your hands clean and stay away from predisposing factors, smoke, that sort of stuff. Um, pretty standard, I would think. And um, yeah, I don't know if I have too much more to offer than that. Probably the nebulizer, I know, is, just makes people nervous at the hospital when you have to put in breathing treatments for people that are worried that this increases the spread. I can't say I've read it, an exact article about this. I guess theoretically it makes more sense, though, if you're using a nebulizer unit, you're kind of vaporizing everything in your, your exhales. So. so Probably is safe to say that if there are uh, predisposing conditions, even mild, uh, that that um, that's a potential risk factor. Probably yes. Not be Len, we have another resource management question for you. Uh, question is: China built new hospitals from scratch to address the COVID nineteen outbreak. McLaren's currently building a new hospital. Um, what construction can be altered or accelerated to address this problem in in the Lansing East Lansing area? Is there a way that we can take the resources that are being applied now to other things and, and redirect them in a timely fashion to COVID-19? The question for me? The question for you. The so resource management question. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not the best management person in the world. Uh, I mean, obviously we're aware of the fact that in China they constructed at least 3,000 bed hospitals in the space of 10 days each or something. Uh, and I know that I think what Sparrow is constructing some additional hospital beds in a parking area. Um, but those, uh, those beds, first of all, are going to be what I'll call ordinary hospital beds. These are not intensive care beds. And so they can be used to manage patients uh, whose disease is not uh, too overwhelming. Uh, but in the case of uh, 
patients who have disease requiring an ICU, we can't build new ICUs with the kind of rapidity that the Chinese were building those additional hospital beds. We can, we can create uh, some additional hospital beds. Uh, the Army knows how to do that, the, the, the field hospitals and so on. But these are, these are not ICU facilities. Great, thanks, Len. So, Rich, there was a question about um, uh, uh, mutation rates and um, and the evolution of the virus. And so, the question is: To what extent has this this virus evolved so far? How many? What kind of variant? What, what number of variants are there currently? And can the geographic origin be tracked by genotype? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so. Uh, this is an RNA virus. Uh, these are viruses that typically have very high mutation rates. So defining evolution as changes in the genotypes uh, as mutations occur, this is definitely happening. So there's a wonderful site for anybody who wants to look uh, on the web. It's called Next Strain, where they have now sequenced approximately 300 uh, complete genomes of this virus from various places around the world. It's an incredible collaborative place because uh, scientists are putting their data out in the, in the public sphere without waiting for publication. And so, yes, it is evolving. Um, there's no doubt that it's evolving. Having said that, what are the implications of this evolution? It's much harder to say. On the one hand, the evolution is very valuable to people trying to follow the epidemic because each of those mutations creates uh, a marker, a, a tag of where it came from. And so you can trace uh, that there were several separate introductions into a community, for example. And that could help with contact tracing, for example. Um, but are, is it changing in a way that makes the disease more severe, less severe? The answer is unknown at present. There have been a couple of speculative papers that I think have not helped uh, the communication. There was a paper that suggested one mutation differentiated between the severe epidemic in Wuhan versus maybe slightly less severe in some other parts of the world, but that, that wasn't causal. That was just simply saying that there was a branch in the tree associated with some of the early outbreak, different from some of the later outbreak. So I don't think we really have any reason to believe that the virus is changing. It was plenty nasty enough to begin with uh, that we need to deal with it as it is. The one place where experts will be looking very closely at it is in terms of thinking about vaccine development. And so there will be efforts to find uh, regions of the virus uh, that are not changing as rapidly uh, because those would have, and again, there are many other considerations besides that, but those would be ones that might potentially be uh, better suited towards a lasting uh, vaccine uh, development. There is a related question by another, um, by another member of the audience who asked about, based on that information you just gave, do we know the source of this virus, where it came from? And, um, and I guess a, a second question, but not necessarily related is, how many days does this virus last on various surfaces? So if we could first talk about what the genotyping has told us about the origins, relationships to bats and things like that, and, and, uh, and then go from there. Yeah, I can answer the first one, but not so much the second one. So the first one, there've been very intense analyses about trying to understand the source. And uh, the closest relative that has been found, well, actually, let me back up. It's very clear this is a point source. That is, everything springs from viruses that were in Wuhan and then have diversified as they have moved out of Wuhan. The closest related virus is one that was found in a bat in China in 2013. Uh, it's a genotype that is quite similar, but still shows a number of differences. That doesn't mean it directly came from a bat. Uh, there is this association with this food market in uh, Wuhan, where a lot of the early cases uh, where people who worked in that market or, or, or favored that market were there around the market. Uh, and um, 
One suggestion is that it may have gone from a bat into an animal in that food market, and maybe there was a slaughtered animal for you know, distribution as food, uh, and that that spread the contagion, uh, but this is unknown. But bat is the closest relative uh, uh, in terms of the source of the virus, but there's certainly the possibility that it went through some other uh, presumably mammal. There were some early reports that maybe it had gone through a snake or something like that, and that's all been pretty much uh, uh, debunked. Uh, it almost certainly went from bats directly into humans or bats through another mammal uh, into, into humans. Uh, Keith English raised another a question related to immunity, and I just wanted to address that because uh, there's some discussion about prior infection. If someone require, re recovers from this viral infection, the likelihood is, is that they did mount a neutralizing antibody to neutralize this virus, otherwise they wouldn't have recovered. So the anticipation is that if you've been infected and recovered from COVID-19, that you would have an immune response. And everything I've heard on the news from Tony Fauci and others is that that is the anticipation. But until we actually study that, we don't really know, but we expect that that's the case, that you will be immunized by being infected by this virus. But this relates also to the genetic uh, change because the mutation rate is such that every individual virus has the, li has the likelihood of at least one or two point mutations. So, the, um, so it may be by the time you're, you're immunized against this one, there's another variant out there. So uh, I think it's still, uh, there's still some open questions there as to how much, um, how much variation this virus can tolerate and how different it can become before uh, before it needs to become and how much it can tolerate uh, change before it can reinfect the uh, person who's been infected already. So <clears throat> there's a question for, for Brett about um, healthcare workers. And if someone gets exposed or if someone's infected with this, with this virus, COVID-19, who's a healthcare worker, uh, how long are they asked to stay home uh, and, and not go to work? And, and um, at some point in time, that's going to be a real problem because that's, uh, that's going to reduce our ability to, to deal with uh, patients. So if you could just address uh, how long do infected healthcare workers remain off work, both in the U.S. and in other countries, if you know anything about that. So far as I know, it's 14 days that you wouldn't be able to go back to work. Uh, you would have to have a presumed source of infection exposure right now, and then you would need to be tested if you showed signs or symptoms of infection would be the, the protocol at this time. So I have um, heard of colleagues who had an exposure and then developed a slight running nose, nothing too dramatic, but there's, they sent in samples and were told to stay home until the results were back, which uh, at the time that I heard this hadn't been performed for a number of days with no known time of uh, return of results. So I presume that the hospital is prioritizing the sample testing toward more critically ill patients. And when they get around to those who've been presenting with a presumed exposure and relatively asymptomatic, I think it might be lower on the priority chain. So. I can't speak to that 100%, but uh, last that I knew a few days ago, this is how things were operating. So you're stuck at home until you've recovered and 14 days later is what I've heard. So the question came up earlier that wasn't yet addressed about how long this virus lasts on surfaces. And um, Esenil Hogapu, uh, uh, who's a postdoc in my group and now studying in Finland, uh, forwarded a recent New England Journal of Medicine article from March 20th where they did a study on um, how long this virus exists on surfaces of different types. So whoever asked that question and wants to know the answer, uh, look at the New England Journal of Medicine article from 20th of March. Um, but when you, when you look at those data, really ask the question, are they looking at infectious virus? Because I've seen many of those studies that are actually looking at RNA. And the RNA may, may persist for a long period of time without being in an infectious particle. And so you have to watch, look at the data carefully. And if it's just looking for a presence of RNA, it could be non-infectious or, or, or it could be um, in an infectious particle. So you have to be careful how you, uh, how you evaluate that data. <clears throat> Another question about, um, about weather and seasons. Uh, the question is, 
If this virus moves from northern to southern hemispheres during the season change, should we expect the same level of extreme illness this time next year, if there, or if there's another mutation or another variant? And that relates to another question about two strains, was one described as strain S and strain L. Uh, Rich, do you have any insights on both of those two questions? Well, taking the second one first, the strain S and strain L was this one that I think has been debunked, uh, that, it, that, that there was some confusion, essentially, as there often is in science, between causation and correlation, uh, that there's no reason to think the particular mutation that split this branching process, this tree of the virus's evolution into two groups, was causal with respect to changes in symptoms. That doesn't mean it isn't. So, you know, absence of evidence is, is itself a weak argument, but I, but I don't think uh, it's clear, it, it's, it's far from settled that there's an important difference between uh, those S and L types. Uh, what was the other, the other question, Chris? Sorry, I can't hear. About the Northern and Southern hemispheres, and if there's gonna be a switch to the Southern hemisphere and then back up to the Northern hemisphere next year, should yep. we have another outbreak, especially if there's a lot of genetic change? So I think, again, what I had read from some work uh, out of, I'm forgetting which group it was now, uh, there's so much coming out all the time on this, but I think the evidence is that even without evolution of the virus changing anything, it's very likely that next year uh, will be as bad next winter, if it even, if it even diminishes during the, the summer, uh, that it will come back with a vengeance even without evolution uh, next year absent the development of a vaccine or changes in our behavior uh, uh, that, that we're already poised for a, another difficult year ahead. Len, I have another ethical question for you. And as it turns out, I think the ethical questions are much harder to answer than the scientific ones. Um, and this question is, how long should we be practicing social distancing before we can go back to work, be able to eat, go out? Um, when should we make that decision? Because at some point in time, we're gonna reach a point of diminishing returns where uh, society's just gonna crumble because nobody's working. So when do we make that decision and how do we make it? You know, you, you gave me the right lead in there. This is one of those questions that I think at this point in time, it's virtually impossible to answer. Um, we have to, at the very least, it seems we have to wait until there is a substantial di diminishment in new infections. Uh, so you have, what, you have what's happening in China right now, that there's a minimal number of new infections that have been identified. And if we were to get to a comparable point in the US, five weeks from now, two months from now, it's impossible to know what the number is there. Uh, then I would think we could sort of uh, pull back from the kind of social distancing and so on. There's a risk uh, in doing that. I mean, we might end up being surprised and we might create a new wave. Uh, and I don't know that there's any way of predicting with confidence uh, that that would happen. Um, so we're really, there's a lot of uncertainty here. And that, I mean, very often science and medicine have to deal with that uncertainty. Um, and politicians are gonna have to make an, uh, experts are going to have to make some judgments and advise politicians and others who are responsible for making these ultimate decisions. Definitely a tough question. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the, the global map of where the cases of COVID-19 are, you notice that Africa and South America seem to have fewer reported cases. And so there's a question that came up how can we, if they do indeed have fewer cases, how can we prevent the spread to Africa and South America? And um, I would leave that up to both Brett and Rich to address. And I think we also have to address, is there actually less infection in those countries or does it just look that way on the map? Chris? Keith, go ahead. This is Keith, just a comment. There are almost a thousand reported cases in South America already. Now, there may not be as many there as here. I mean, we have a lot more than that in the United States, but it's definitely not excluding South America. So there are cases. And I've got to run, but I would recommend uh, an article in today's New York Times for people to look at from Dan Katz at Yale. And he is sort of questioning the current social distancing strategy. Not that it's not a good idea 
to uh, blunt the spread, but uh, wondering if it's not a mistake to not focus more on the most vulnerable population, namely the elderly. He's worried that having more people staying home from work and school, uh, those people may in fact wind up having more contact with their, say, grandparents, who are the people most likely to develop disease. And he's wondering if it will backfire to close the uh, schools and jobs for the folks who are generally younger, healthier, and at lower risk, uh, and not focus more on the elderly and the people at the highest risk. It's a provocative article. It's worth reading. It's in the New York Times today. Dan Katz, K-A-T-Z, is the author. <clears throat> also uh, addressing uh, transmission, there's a question that came up. Why don't we encourage more face covering as a part of the uh, um, uh, hygiene uh, methods? Why are we kind of discouraging wearing, wearing um, masks? And if it is due to a shortage of masks, why not scarves or kerchiefs or t-shirts or some other thing to keep the droplets from spreading? And so, uh, Brett, I was going to toss this out to you. Why not, um, why not encourage people to wear bandanas and scarves? And what are the problems with that? Uh, and is it going to prevent any transmission if we do that? Uh, when I'm seeing patients now in the hospital, I wear a mask in every room just because it's hard to know about what you're walking into. Um, maybe in the future world, everyone wears a mask all the time, you know, and gloves too. So I don't know. It's, I guess it's hard to argue. If you feel sick, you should be wearing a mask, I feel, because it's more about you spreading it to others than others protecting themselves from you, I believe. So uh, the pro protocol in the hospital is anyone coming in with a cough or respiratory complaint is going to get a mask on. And probably most patients by now, I would think, are getting a mask anyway. Um, healthcare providers are putting on protective gear outside of the rooms of anyone with a suspected infection. So, I mean, if you're not worried about gang warfare in your neighborhood, you know, you can probably choose a bandana and be all right. Michigan's very safe, I feel, so feel free. Hey, Chris, uh, imagine walking into a bank with your face covered with a bandana. That would be problematic in many cases. It could be, yes. Um, <clears throat> So this is something for all of us to uh, ponder. I'll probably ask each of you because I don't know if there's a right answer to this or not, uh, or if there is an answer. And I'll, I'll really kind of slowly so you have time to think about it. But with a pandemic like this, is there anything that could be done to prevent this from happening again after we deal with COVID-19? Are there precautions we should be taking to prevent viruses coming out of nature or coming out of uh, environment and infecting humans is there anything that can be done and i'm not sure where to start and um i might just ask rich to address this first and then ask the other two of you afterward well i guess one possible piece of advice would be we don't seem to have been very well prepared for this one in terms of the amounts of protective equipment available for hospital workers healthcare workers uh, so i think uh, we will when this challenge is over, almost certainly there will be greater attention to having a reserve. I guess on a more political note, uh, there have been concerned that we don't even have the means of production of some of the things that we've relied on uh, uh, developing countries to make many of the things that we view as essential. We're lucky we have all the food we need, but uh, maybe we don't have all the pharmaceuticals uh, being produced locally that we need. So I think it will refocus our minds on uh, preparation for the unexpected. Um, I think uh, uh, certainly areas where there's trade in wildlife and uh, encroachment on areas uh, where there are animals living uh, uh, that we have not previously had close encounters with, uh, we, we may need to revisit. Uh, I mean, those are certainly very important environmental issues to begin with, but th this draws attention to those issues as well. Brett, anything to add to that, how to prevent a pandemic like this happening again? Well, yeah, go ahead. 
Um, so, I mean, there are even more scary things out there, right? The equine encephalo, encephalovirus from, I believe, 2016 killed something like 90% of veterinarians who came in contact. In that time, that was bats in Australia. Uh, luckily, Australia, in my experience, is pretty sparsely populated, so it's not a huge population. They're all pretty cl closely clustered by each other, and otherwise, some of the livestock areas are pretty not dense. Um, I'd be terrified, if, and I do know that they mobilized very quickly to make uh, a vaccine for the horses at that time. You can't very well target the bats out there. So I would say that vaccine development should be a priority out of this, uh, similar to humans learn lessons and forget them quite quickly. But, you know, hopefully this pandemic doesn't turn out to have long-term consequences. I mean, HIV, you're not very sick when you first get it, but it doesn't turn out too hot after a while. So that's my main fear is that you're dealing with a new virus that just like a computer new virus, I suppose. They wreck havoc and they, you don't know how they've done it because it hasn't presented before. So again, I think uh, focus on not only diagnostics because if you have informed decision-making, that's very helpful to, for, for medical treatment and for all of us as humans to socially uh, isolate ourselves appropriately given a threat like this. And I think it does offer the opportunity to look at, are you ready for a, a very bad sort of problem to, that could arise, such as some sort of respiratory transmitted, you know, HIV analog or, I mean, a virus, you can tell they can do lots and lots and lots of things and they're more or less randomly generated in a way. They have predisposed their other predecessors, as we know from our evolutionary things but uh, a lot of things can happen quickly as you know especially with the rna so i'm hoping that we do get herd immunity and if we're all going to get it it's you know not great to be an 80 year old person with lung disease ever and this is not going to help so i think uh the most simple precautions are the most logical people washing their hands you know, not coughing on each other not going to work sick just so we can, you know, get our paycheck, that would be nice, but reality is reality, so so we'll see at the end, I think. But we should be ready. I mean, the reason that South America and Africa can't do the diagnostics is that they don't have real-time PCR machines, period, right? So they're not going to be able to do that, our main gold standard analytics. So until they're provided with such things, that uh, will be the case, I believe. And things will definitely spread south of the border as well. The population of Lima, Peru with, with uh, tuberculosis is truly off the charts. And so uh, this will join and travel probably more quickly than, than tuberculosis. So that's my fear. They will definitely have something that will persist given the transmission properties that we see. And my fear is if we don't maintain some surveillance and scientific vigilance, which I doubt we will, as humans, we'll be curious of a new thing, but uh, I would be concerned for long-term probable possibilities as well, so those will be curious things to find out about later. Great, thanks Brett. Thanks, so, Len, I'm going to give you a quick comment and then I have a, a question for the group again. Len. Yeah, my quick comment is everybody should recall that in both China and the US, there were very self-serving political considerations that slowed the development of an appropriate response to the early portion of this epidemic. Things would not be as bad as they are today if in fact we had right, ramped up our ability to do testing weeks earlier. Uh, and it was simply the worst kind of political considerations that prevented that from happening. Well, that's the perfect- Chris, can I make a quick yeah, comment? Go ahead, Maria. If I can have peace for just a minute here. Um, I want to echo what people have said and want to say a couple of things. One is, to me, the root of a lot of the future of this is at human behaviors. And um, uh, one 
one issue that's important is the planning issue. Everybody had pandemic preparedness plans in place, many of which haven't been looked at since 2009, perhaps, or updated or thought about or touched or, right? So, um, so part of the challenge here is not letting the concept of pandemic, pandemic slip out of people's minds as we move forward in time, because as um, both Brett and Rich have said, the probability of these types of things are just increasing over time with climate change and with more human animal interface. Um, the second human behavioral thing here is, you know, starting healthy habits and creating um, social structures that support um, ways that people can be distant from animals. So a lot of this is zoonotic diseases that are transmitted between humans and animals, right? So figuring out strategies to um, help humans be able to do that. Sometimes there's poverty, um, questions of poverty here that are the root causes of, of these things, other structural things, political issues, right? So there's, there's human behavior, um, uh, things that we can change, right? To Even though the the bugs aren't going to um, give us the time to change necessarily, but things that we can do to to make um, make the make these things uh, move more move differently, even though they might not be any less probable. So wash your hands. <laughs> there are a couple of comments that have come out of the audience that are uh, relevant to this discussion. Uh, Daniel Havelcheck says, "Keep the bats out of the food markets," and I think that's probably good advice. Not only is it um, keeping humans and animals separate, but keeping multiple species of animals separate. If what Rich pointed out earlier is correct, that the bass transmitted to an animal, the animal transmitted to a human, having that kind of selection and, and, and diverse population of uh, diverse sets of animals all in one small cluster presents problems. And having humans environments in environments where there are multiple um, animals in one place in small cages stacked one on top of the other is the problem. But there are people of other have to eat, right? So people have to do have to eat, right? So the reason that that exists is because people, why do kids eat? Why did, you know, why did Ebola? I don't, you know, who knows how true this is, but people have to eat. So they'll find protein sources wherever they can get it, right? So I, the poverty root of this is important to address, I think. Absolutely true. Um, so there's been a number of people commenting and people texting me about an article written by a, uh, a professor at Stanford, Ioannidis. He uh, suggested that we're taking, our actions are too drastic and, um, and based on incomplete or poor data and that the far reaching consequences of our social distancing are much worse than uh, the disease impact on society. And so um, maybe we'll start with Len again, because this is more of a ethical question. Where do you draw the line? And, and it also relates to what Rich said in the very beginning, uh, the quote that he read is that anything we do uh, before the pandemic seems extreme and anything we do after seems like inadequate. So um, how do we draw lines, Len, in this, in this discussion? If we, if we insist on waiting for complete data that yields absolute certainty, we'll all be dead. That would be, I, I think, the situation we'd find ourselves in. That, of course, is an exaggerated point of view. Um, and in general, we want to, I think we want to err on the side of safety. Uh, I know the, the choices that have been made with regard to uh, shutting down lots of businesses and, and so on over the past few days seems extreme, but the fact of the matter is that uh, it seems that when you've got relatively large crowds in close spaces, there's ample opportunity for transmission. The fact that all those basketball players have apparently been infected is indicative of that kind of a problem. Uh, and so I don't know that what the choices that have been made so far are that extreme or, or that they're really unnecessary. I think things would likely be a lot worse if we did not make those choices sooner rather than later. I'm gonna ramp up, I'm gonna speed up the discussion a little bit because there are a lot of questions coming in that we're not, not getting to and I wanna bounce around a little bit. I've tried to try to keep this a coherent conversation but I'm gonna bounce around a little bit to address the issues that have been coming up and try to coalesce several questions into one. And um, vaccines, of course, will take <clears throat> uh, at least one and a half years, if not longer, 
to be developed and maybe even longer to scale up to make widely distributed. So maybe there's more, um, uh, more hope in, in a drug, especially one that's already been used and FDA approved that has shown it can be repurposed for this particular virus. So can we uh, have uh, comments on chloroquine and some of the other drugs that have been talked about? And it's also, also an ethical consideration because if chlor the, the data on chloroquine is all anecdotal, but it also is not too, uh, the side effects of chloroquine aren't too bad. So why not just use it and see what happens? Uh, that's the question that came up. It's not me asking, it's coming from the audience. And what other drugs are out there? So um, maybe Len will talk about first um, drugs that have some anecdotal evidence suggesting they may be helpful and they already are used in the human population. What should we do with things like chloroquine? Chris, I actually had somebody from the neighborhood say, uh, say I, they heard on Fox News about this report in France of where 40 people are given chloroquine and they were, they were all, they all recovered as a result of that. No, that's bad science. The, the, the fact of the matter is that if they had all had three glasses of milk for 14 days in a row, they also would have recovered. Uh, and so the relationship between the chloroquine and uh, COVID-19 is really, it's unknown whether, because most people are going to recover. And so you're going to get good statistics from 40 people in all likelihood, at least, if not more, most likely by chance. And so uh, there, I don't know that there's any drug out there that's already out there that all of a sudden is going to prove to be a miracle drug. Um, that would surprise me. And the only way we would know that is to do some really hard scientific, well, well-formed uh, trials. Uh, the uh, the random kind of presentation of information is really not helpful, certainly not to the broad public. Related to this, and I just want to uh, include a, a couple of questions coming from the audience, is that uh, serum from recovered patients or convalescent serum uh, apparently has been used in China. Of course, we use uh, HIVIG and other gamma globulin in the U.S. as well. Um, what are the hopes of using gamma globulin from patients that have recovered from COVID-19 as a way to control this, this infection? Rich, you want to start? I, again, let me emphasize, I am far from an expert, but when I've heard experts talk about this, like Arturo Casadevall uh, had an editorial in the Wall Street Journal about historical successes of this approach, and uh, it, it's one of the things, so as Len said, all of these things have to be done in a context um, either of compassionate attempts to rescue somebody who's otherwise uh, fated to die, or alternatively, what you really need are the, uh, the, the careful uh, trials. But it seems as though uh, prior to the development of a vaccine, that serum approach, uh, I think it will be tried, and uh, we can hope that that uh, uh, provides success. Great. Right. Um, so there's some questions about the, the detrimental effects of social distancing on children. Um, and um, one of the people in the audience cites that they were in the dollar store and somebody came within 20 feet of a, stu of a, of a child and the child ran screaming, petrified that they were coming in, in contact, close contact with another human. So what do you anticipate, maybe, maybe we'll start with Maria on this one, what do you anticipate will be the long-term consequences of having gone through this as a child? Um, it, there could be some positive things that come out of it, better hand washing, better hygiene, but there could some, be some really traumatic impact on, on children that are going through this with the fear of dying from an infectious disease of becoming close contact with people. Yeah, so... Um... One thing we know is that children's response to a lot of risks is mediated through their parental response. So a lot of this is dependent on how their parents communicate to them about risks. One thing we know is that um, anybody who's going through this type of event likes to believe that there's something that they can do in order to, um, maybe it's to protect themselves, maybe it's to help other people, right? Something that is available for them to do to 
either protect themselves or protect other people or help other people um, during the course of this kind of event. So there's a lot of actual, for, for people who have children, there's a lot of guidance out there that exists about how to communicate with your children about these types of events. A, a sort of sad um, outcome of the, the sort of mass shooter culture in our um, country is that this has been something that's been researched over and over again, how you talk to your kids about trauma, how you talk to your kids about risk, risk, et cetera. And um, part of the recommendation is um, identify ways to, um, you know, make a decision, an appropriate decision based on age about what topics are appropriate for discussion with them. Um, identify ways to um, reassure them without over reassuring them in a way that's deceptive. Um, and there's a whole set of recommendations around this. So the long-term consequences, I think, are in part dependent on how willing and able parents are to have these kinds of discussions with their kids. Um, with that said, parents aren't uh, aren't always receiving information about how to do this best, right? I know I don't do research on this topic particularly, but there's not a lot of interventions around to kind of train parents on how to do this sort of intervention around um, diseases particularly um, or um, other forms of trauma. Um, the other thing that I'll say here is our, we know from our research that social networks are very important to people's well-being. So not having um, exposure or access to social networks, depending on how far people take the issue of social distancing, um, that can result in um, health outcomes for people, right? So, um, so that's a, another risk that we can think about here. As people social distance from others, they lose those support systems as well. Um, so something to think about as this moves forward in the future. So I don't know how many of the panelists are reading the questions and looking at the chats that are coming through. If you're reading those, you see that you guys have stirred up quite a bit of controversy, which um, is expected, I guess. Um, questions of if, if social distance, distancing isn't really um, tried and true and we don't have any hard data, we argue that social distancing is good, but then we look at chloroquine and there's no hard data and we say that that's a drug, it might be bad to test that in people. So are we using this, the same argument on two sides for two different things or are we being fair in how we look at the uh, use of chloroquine and how we look at, at social distancing and the um, extent to which we're keeping people apart? Are we, are we, are we adequately and fairly analyzing the, um, the data and taking the appropriate actions or are we biasing it one way or the other? And I'm, Len, I'm gonna let you take that because it was related to your answer on chloroquine and your answer on, on social distancing being somewhat um, discordant. I, I really don't know exactly how to respond to, to that particular challenge. Um, it, the, as Dan Havlicek in a side comment points out, there, there are some actual trials that they're trying to do with regard to chloroquine. It could turn out that it has some degree of effectiveness, we just don't know. Um, but we don't, I don't think it's appropriate to advertise or suggest to the public that if you can just get hold of this drug, that you're gonna be in much better shape than anybody else. That, that just seems misguided. Rich? Yeah, I'd like to chime in because I think, um, in terms of, well, we haven't done experiments on social distancing. The difference here is that we know social distancing works because we know the mechanism is an infectious agent. It may have side effects in terms of anxiety, in terms of economic consequences, all those need to be considered. But we do know we're dealing with an infectious agent and therefore social distancing, which people have pointed out really should be called physical distancing because you can have social interactions as we're doing right now. Um, but so that to me is a difference. Whereas we don't know for some of these drugs whether there's any reason to believe they work or don't work. And so that's why we need a randomized trial as Len has said in those cases. But I think social distancing, physical distancing, we know that works because we're dealing with an infectious agent. So we don't need a trial to prove that that will work. We need to examine the consequences for employment and so on, but we know that that will break transmission chains. Hey, Chris, let me add one other thing. And that is we had a natural experiment occur on that cruise ship where 705 people were infected, okay? Uh, and so, that, and that came about because of a lack of social or physical distance that was required by the fact they were all on that cruise ship. 
So if you want some evidence, that would be it. So this relates to another question that came up from uh, one of the uh, audience members. And the question is, will mass testing, if that's possible, if we had millions and millions of tests as were predicted last week and earlier this week, um, and they were all used in an effective way, would that uh, decrease the need for sheltering in place? Um, use, for example, South Korea. And would you then ever let people who are negative uh, behave differently than people who tested positive? Maria or Len, or want to pick that one up? Rich already volunteered. Okay, Rich. So, um, I mean, I think South Korea is a perfect example of where the testing was uh, deployed at a very high level and provided incredibly valuable information. Um, there's also the issue though of, of, that came up earlier that I think it's important to return to, that somebody who may have tested positive, uh, obviously when they're tested positive for a period, you want them in quarantine and isolated from other individuals so they don't transmit. But it was pointed out that for healthcare workers, if they've tested positive and hopefully the vast majority make a good recovery, those are actually people who can play roles uh, in terms of uh, 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 assuming, and again, it hasn't been, I guess, entirely proven, but typical response would be there would be some lasting immunity uh, that would allow that person to actually play a vital role uh, in, in contacting patients, whereas somebody who tests, a healthcare worker who tested negative remains uh, highly vulnerable. So I think the testing both of the, is an individual infected is incredibly important, but then retrospective testing of whether individuals have maybe had an asymptomatic infection uh, serologically, can you demonstrate that they've been infected and have now recovered? Uh, that will also be extremely valuable. And I expect that we will gear up. We've been slow to gear things up, but I think on both fronts, we will have to gear things up as quickly as we can. Thank you. So we are coming close to the end of the uh, two hours. I know for those of you that are panelists and hopefully for the attendees that two hours went fast uh, because it did for me. Um, and I know that we can't cover every issue. I'm reading all these questions thinking I wish we had a, a day or two to answer all these questions. We just aren't gonna get to them. So if you ask questions that we didn't ask, that we didn't address or answer, I'm sorry we didn't get to them. But um, we will make this, um, uh, we are recording this session and we will make it available. One of the audience uh, attendees asked if it was, um, it was gonna be made available and we will. Um, we think it's really important as educators that we get information out to the public and to as many people as we can and thoughtful consideration of the, of the problems, the, the ethical considerations, the scientific ones, and get out as much data as we can to keep people um, uh, healthy and safe and, it, and we feel it's our obligation to do that so we will make this uh, video available and I'm hoping you will share it with your friends and, and, uh, and colleagues. But what I'd like to do in the last 15 minutes that we have left is ask each of the four panelists to do, give some summary remarks and maybe cover, if you've been reading the questions that come up that we didn't get, co cover some of those questions or anything we feel that we didn't yet address. And uh, again, we'll try to limit everybody to about, um, to about four minutes so that we, we can uh, finish on time. And I will keep a clock, so if you see me uh, waving my hands, it's because you're over your four minutes. So um, let's start first with a very practical consideration of what's facing the healthcare uh, in this country. And uh, I'd like to start with Brett, if you wanna give some closing remarks on, um, on where, what we can do as a, as a community and what the healthcare professionals are, are struggling with and um, what kind of help we can provide and any other closing remarks you may have. Um, <clears throat> I think the main thing that is important is just staying kind of clean and responsible. It seems kind of silly, but like the hand hygiene thing is so important, I feel. Um, I've been an ER doc for almost 10 years now, and I've not had antibiotics, but for one time when I had traveler's diarrhea out of Peru, and the reason I felt I suffered there was it was difficult to find running water with the bar of soap, with toilet paper, all these basic sort of things. Um, I think just people keeping clean is the most important part. Most of us are pretty cognizant of, 
our spreading of our own germs. Um, I think it's important that if you do have an illness, I mean, I, I'm a pretty big proponent of an old fashioned sort of remedy for a virus. You know, this one seems quite similar to others. When you look at it, it looks like the old folk can go down pretty hard, which is again expected from influenza. Um, so I'm a big fan of the, you know, vitamin C, orange juice, chicken noodle soup, stay hydrated with your Gatorade or, uh, so you have electrolytes, um, Tylenol and ibuprofen alternated, you know, that's going to be the mainstay of treatment. If people do go home, I don't think this is a, the audience that this is maybe really interesting for, but people who do attend to just basic sort of hygiene and, uh, viral syndrome, symptomatic control at their home. We all have pretty good amount of resources in the United States available at our corner, corner stores, 7-Eleven. So um, to me, that's what's important. If your whole family's sick, you know, maybe I'll just stay there and lump it out together, hopefully. If you're, of course, having respiratory problems, if you can't breathe, you can't live. So that's obviously a reason to go and call 911 if you really are having respiratory difficulties and things are progressing that way, you really probably don't have a great choice because there's not going to be an oxygen unit at your house. Um, otherwise, I think there's a lot to be done as far as research uh, on how to treat this problem in a, a new sort of way. Hydroxychloroquine, I'm a little bit skeptical of that. It sounds like the old British Army coming back for their same gin treatment plan uh, for malaria fighting in, in the conquest lands. So I don't know if hydroxychloroquine makes much sense, but perhaps it does. I'll have to see what evidence comes out for that. Steroids might make some sort of difference, I suppose, but there, were, there was no evidence out of China to support really uh, steroids unless it's already indicated to uh, combat your respiratory disease. Um, so otherwise I know that the anti, the Tamivir and, uh, Tamiflu sort of influenza medications weren't known to be of much help at this time. So I think probably new, new avenues of treatment might come out of this since it seems to be such a novel a pathogen and with the novel pathogenesis. And so I think time will tell and hopefully it's not too terrible and we all recover and gain immunity is what I'm hoping. So, and it's good to be prepared for the next round. If this one's not a bad one, at least we're learning lessons at this time. So I hate to be, I'm not a big cry wolf guy. And I also hate to be the one who poo poos everything. If really everybody gets quite sick out of this. So I guess time will tell and we should all try to be cautious and, um, look at this as an opportunity to improve overall health pretty much, you know, go outside and go jogging and not be indoors with others perhaps. Great. Thanks, Brett. Uh, Maria, you had so many uh, comments that you sent in advance that we didn't get to. I was wondering if you'd like to take a few minutes to, uh, to uh, take, make a few closing remarks. Sure. So one thing that has come up a little bit in the questions that we haven't really talked about, but I'd like to just remind people of is um, the sort of cultural and social dynamics of this kind of outbreak. And two things st stick out at me and things that I've talked about with my students and with my colleagues in recent times. One is, you know, in the United States, we have a dominant culture of sort of individualism and several people brought up questions around, you know, this, you know, kind of don't tell me what to do or I, I'm going to take care of myself and not worry about other people. And so um, I would just remind us that that's, that's something that's well documented uh, among, among people and differences in terms of how people um, see their individual responsibility in the case of a, a kind of collective crisis like this. So I want to just reinforce that um, each individual has a role to play in terms of um, slowing the spread of this epidemic. Um, the second thing I'll say is uh, what's really coming to light in our field is the use of language and um, the use of uh, uh, 
stereotypes and frankly racist language around uh, the COVID outbreak. And so I would just remind everyone um, to, you know, be mindful of the language that you use. I'm having reports of my students, from my students, particularly international students, of sort of bullying incidents and um, confrontations in stores in the Lansing, East Lansing area. Um, and it really, that really, of course, we we knew this is this was coming. If you understand, you know, so how how people respond to these kinds of kinds of threats, but. Um, I just want to reinforce to everybody to really think about the language that they're using as they talk about this epidemic and um, and just sort of keep that in mind as you're speaking with people um, about it. Uh, finally, the last thing, and I, you know, we, as I said, kind of at the offset here, we, we understand a lot about what motivates people's behaviors and um, uh, communication is part of that, but there's lots of other options that um, we have as a society to help people shift their behavior or shift their thinking. And if you take something like preparedness behaviors or health behavior, you know, hand washing behavior, social distancing, um, we're not using that full range of tools that we have available, right? Communication is part of this, but there's also policies that can change. There's incentive systems to put in place to help people um, manage preparedness, et cetera. So there's all kinds of ways that can help um, as we move forward in the future to, um, instead of just letting history repeat itself over and over again, um, prepare us as things um, emerge in the future. So I would just um, stop at that. Great, thanks, Maria. Uh, Len, do you wanna follow up on that and uh, with your closing remarks? Sure, two, two quick points. I wanna first go back to a question asked earlier, what's the difference between H1N1 and COVID-19? And how is that related to social distancing with H1N1? People were symptomatic and then they were infectious. Uh, with uh, The problem with COVID-19 is that now it seems relatively clear that people are infectious even when they're asymptomatic. And that's the main reason why you have to have the social distancing. That makes it, that's a difference. Secondly, in terms of understanding the problem of individualism in the United States, that we have individualized health insurance. That's a major problem. We have uh, approximately 30 million people who are uninsured and another 60 or 70 million who are underinsured. Why is that a problem? Because if individuals have symptoms, maybe it's the flu, maybe it's COVID-19. Maybe it's the flu, maybe it's COVID-19. The government has said, if I've got COVID-19, maybe I can be treated for free. But if it's the flu and I go into an ER, then it's going to cost me anywhere from $200 to $500. So I'm not going to go in. I'm just going to stay out. I'll do the usual things and see what happens. And so I will be an infectious agent in the community. That's a problem with our healthcare system and how we finance healthcare. And that is a, uh, contributes to the spread of something like COVID-19. Thanks, Len. Uh, Rich, you want to follow up with some closing remarks and we'll try to wind up by uh, seven o'clock. Yeah, let's see what I would like to say. One is uh, there is this discussion that this mostly hits older people um, or people with existing conditions. And I think we all know people with existing conditions who may not be older. I did want to point in an, out an analysis I saw that was very interesting that regardless of your age, this disease seems about 20 or 30 times more likely to be fatal than the typical seasonal flu. So it's a very low probability for both for uh, uh, younger people, but it's a non-zero probability. So it ramps up, uh, but on a logarithmic scale, the proportional factor is pretty high at all ages. Uh, so I think that's something people need to keep in mind. Um, uh, and so something, for example, for I did a quick calculation for somebody uh, in their 20s and without any other health issues, uh, the regular flu might be uh, a one in 500 um, or something like that. But you start ramping that up and, uh, or, I'm sorry, one in uh, uh, 5,000, but you start multiplying that by tenfold and it's, it's a non-zero probability. And we are seeing uh, examples of healthy young people having severe outcomes. The other thing I guess I would say is sort of this analogy, probably everybody sees it of the tip of the iceberg. And um, I wanna just remind people that this is something that in the absence of control appears to double every week or perhaps a little bit faster. And it takes several weeks for people to go from an initial infection for that unfortunate minority who succumb. It can take several weeks. 
And so we're really sort of seeing a lagging indicator in the, in the mortality that foretells many underlying infections, some of which thankfully will remain asymptomatic, uh, but others will develop. And so that's why I think uh, this uh, physical social distancing has been so important is uh, we already see evidence of uh, exponential increase in both mortality and in cases, and uh, uh, we have to put a halt to it uh, as quickly as we can, because exponential growth is a scary thing. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rich. I want to thank all the panelists for taking their time. Many of us have been on Zoom calls from 8 in the morning until 8 at night this week, trying to address all the issues that have come up in our units as the units shut down, as, as, as uh, issues come up. And I really appreciate the two hours you took with, with your families, your dogs, um, your, your, and your very uh, uh, your extreme generosity of time. And I really appreciate that. The comments I've been getting by text and, and, and through some of the um, uh, Zoom communication is that everybody learned quite a bit from your uh, uh, comments and the time you've taken. And I think um, everybody is very appreciative of you taking the time to have this discussion. So I want to thank the four of you again. And I want to thank Libby and Laura, Heather and, and Nisa and Sonia who are all on the screen because they, they're the ones that made this happen. And um, they've been quiet through the, uh, through the uh, most of the uh, um, webcast today, but have been really uh, critical in making this um, event happen in such short notice. If there's a, oh, I'm glad you're joining. If there's any uh, interest in doing this again, please let us know. We can uh, do an update like this again in the future. And I'm hoping at some time in the not too distant future, we'll go back to the regular format of Brews and Views, where we can pick controversial topics that are more hypothetical and not so realistic. Dealing with this problem in real time makes it so much more acute. And I appreciate your time in addressing this. So thank you all very much and uh, be healthy, stay safe, use proper social distancing or physical distancing. Thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>